Our final reader tonight is uh, Pamela Ahrens. Thank you so much for joining us. We so appreciate it. Um, Pamela Ahrens' second novel, The Virgins, published by Tin House Books in August 2013, 2030, no, 2013, <laughs> was described by John Irving in the New York Times as flawlessly executed and irrefutably true. The Virgins appeared on the best books of 2013 lists at The New Yorker, The New Republic, Library Journal, and Salon. In April, Tin House Books will reissue Pamela's debut novel, The Understory, which was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the Williams Royan International Prize for Writing. Pamela's short fiction, reviews, and essays have appeared in a wide variety of literary, cultural, and mainstream publications, including Chicago Review, Boston Review, New England Review, Los Angeles Review of Books, The Millions, The New York Times, and Elle. Please welcome Pamela Ahrens. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I'm just going to give a little bit of introductory material about the novel. I know some of you know it, thank you, and others don't. So The Virgins is um, about a, a, an East Coast boarding school in the, in the late 1970s. And it's uh, particularly about three students at that school. Uh, two of them belong to groups that up until the time that the novel takes place, um, were almost completely outsiders to a boarding school like Auburn Academy. Um, one uh, is a girl. Um, she's Jewish and from Chicago, and she's 16, and she's a new student this year. The other, um, Sung, is a uh, the son of Korean, uh, is a Korean American, son of Korean immigrants, immigrants from Korea, and he's 17. And the two of them fall into a very passionate relationship, and they kind of become the campus it couple in part because of their very open sexuality. And the third character, um, Bruce Bennett Jones, is um, from all external appearances, the insider. He's the son of, he, he goes to Auburn because his father went there and his grandfather went there and his great grandfather went there. And um, he more than anyone else is obsessed with this outsider couple that kind of manages to be at the same time the cool couple and um, he also happens to be the book's narrator but he's sort of an unusual narrator because he as he admits early on he doesn't really know of even some story um, he is inventing it from clues hints observations and his own intuition um, and we learn eventually that the reason he's telling the story, um, it's an attempt to explain to us and to himself um, how it is that Song and Aviva's relationship ended um, in tragedy. So I'm just going to read two very brief uh, portions. Some of the, there are longer and shorter <coughs> chapters in this novel. Some of them are very short. And the first will just uh, give you a bit of a sense of this young couple and kind of their explore, their sensual explorations with each other. The students exit the day's last class into darkness. 6.30 and the dining hall is a brilliant bubble of glass. Aviva sits with her friends, sung with his. Afterward, they walk in the snow. Aviva's toes and fingers always hurt in the cold. She wears boots with fur linings, the thickest she can find. Sung shows her yet another of the secret places he knows. The science building is built into a hill, leaving a crawl space beneath one corner of the foundation. A steam pipe exits into the crawl space. The temperature in there must be 80 degrees. They wedge themselves under the slanting foundation, unzip their jackets. The gravel floor is not uncomfortable. They can sit here unseen, watching the snow fall, stripped down to their shirts. Outside the lit snow, the dark figures exiting the buildings. It's beautiful, Aviva says. She unbuttons his shirt, warming her hands on his chest. He leans his head against the dirty concrete wall. She never fails to be stirred by this gesture of his, the way he bares his throat to her like a dog acknowledging the stronger creature in a fight. It strikes her to her depths. She kisses him gently, then imperiously, crawling onto his lap and holding him fiercely around the waist with her legs. The paths have emptied. 
The snow is thickly cratered with footprints that cross this way and that and fall into each other. Aviva and Sung emerge into a private field. He stands behind her in the tracks, his wide hands on her shoulders. He takes three large steps away from her. Stand tall, he says. Keep your arms straight at your side, like a board. <clears throat> he knows she'll do it on the first try. Her trust in him is absolute. Obediently, she lets herself fall. She watches the dark sky rise up over her and then rush away again. Then she lies safe in Sung's hands. <coughs> again, she murmurs. They do it over and over, but they agree she can't catch him. He weighs so much more than she does. So the second um, little chapter I'll read, a, a bit of an issue between Sung and Aviva is drugs. Sung is, is kind of an enthusiastic drug ta recreational drug taker, and he would like to share this with Aviva, but she has uh, her own feelings and issues around it, so this will give you a taste of that. Sung has got his hands on something new. Quaaludes, he tells her. Methoqualone, if you want to know the scientific name. There are four medium-sized white pills taped inside a packet of white tissue paper. Sung goes to the library, the public library, not the academy library, to research the stuff he and his friends put into their bodies. It's not so much that he's concerned about his health, just that he likes to see the molecular diagrams with their long hyphenated names, to memorize the chemical formulas and know that chlorine destroys LSD molecules on contact. It's not useful information, but it interests him, perhaps as much as does the experience of alteration. In these explorations, you can see in him the son his father wished to raise, the one who understands that science is the only truly reputable calling for a son. Sung is pulling bees in chemistry only because he has an aptitude for memorization. He takes it on his father's insistence. The urgency of it all escapes him, but the poetry of ingested substances engages him. Bioavailability, metabolism, half-life. What will it do to me, asks Aviva. If it's good stuff, he explains, you go into a kind of trance in which all the world seems benevolent and amusing. You love everyone. And if it's not good stuff, you just get relaxed, he assures her. It's a Saturday in early December. They're in his room. He wanted to go to the bog, but she refused. It's way too cold, and she doesn't like being around other kids who are half out of their minds with whatever they're on. He swallows his pills first to give her confidence. She doesn't ask where he got the drugs. Sung, Stern, Giddings, Detweiler, the pack of them returned from Thanksgiving break with supplies replenished. They have contacts at home. At Auburn, it's harder, tricky to tr trust the townies, with whom there's always the factor of resentment. Academy students have been double-crossed. In Auburn, the town is very small, a hard place to keep secrets. The last thing anyone needs is a couple of police officers showing up at the dean of students' office, asking questions. So, better to stack up over vacations. Why should a kid like Sung, a proctor in his dorm, able student, musician, swimmer, bound for a lesser ivy or a good small liberal arts college, why should he risk himself? Why should he spend so much time in the pursuit and exploration of illicit substances? What is he looking for or avoiding? Is he motivated by an unhealthy need for excitement, feelings of inadequacy, an impulse towards self-destruction? No, no, the older generation has the wrong vocabulary altogether. They're blinded by concepts like illegality, addiction, and maybe even sin. Sung's passion for intoxication has to do with his discovery that very first time an older kid passed a spliff to him at a middle school base football game, that there is something beyond or behind what ordinary experience presents to him, something he privately calls the inside. Only rarely does that inside reveal itself. Mostly it teases him with transient glimmers of radiant energy in a field of grass, the panting of a dog, the mute mouth of a doorway. But when it comes in full, he has the sensation of touching reality, or at least a reality more real than the one available to him day by day. There is an end to the unease, the sense he has of never being at home. During these times of illumination, he sees himself as comical, but it's a sympathetic view, not a disdainful one. He has no family, no constricting allegiances. He is simply one golden child of the universe. He can see the suffering of each fellow creature like a brilliant steam rising from the pores 
a nimbus terrible and exquisite at once. It's the suffering that makes each person beautiful, like a bracelet, like a cage. He has enormous compassion for everyone, and the fact that the suffering will continue, that he can do nothing about it, does not unduly distress him. <coughs> this is simply how things must be. It is at these times that Sung sees in the hollow of his palm, or hiding in the stand of trees, the things that later he must make, the drawings of leopards with golden eyes, the perfect spheres carved out of wood. Sung's words tempt Aviva. She too would like to go somewhere else, to see into the nature of things. She would like her heart to open. She would like to see the astonishing colors Sung speaks of. She would like beauty to supplant fear. But she is afraid. She suspects that in the honeycomb of her subconscious brain there do not, in fact, like caverns of benevolence and fellow feeling. Rather, she expects there are, there are evil things lurking there, rage, a lust for conquest, cruelty. Why would she want to loosen the chains? Here is a girl for whom even the phantasms of movies are too much sometimes to endure. She's learned to say no to thrillers, gangster films, anything having to do with supernatural powers or aliens. Anything along those lines terrorizes her, makes her clutch her head as if the control and good sense in it might be sucked away. Some lends her books to read, trying to explain where he's coming from. Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception, Abu Hoffman on LSD. Nothing can happen, Some promises. I'll be with you the whole time. But that's not good enough, she thinks. He can't be inside her mind, where the caverns are. She could wander away from him down there, out of his protective grasp. She, her very being, might be stolen. She says she's sorry, really, really sorry, but no, no quaaludes, no nothing. He badgers her for a while, is gloomy and disappointed, then lets it go. Thank you.